I think if there are any questions at this time, then I will try to answer them now. I'm just um, looking for my questions here. I'm having some trouble with uh, the Q&A. Just give me a second. Okay, I've got a question here. As part of client disaster recovery strategy, strategy is it possible to persist queues in DB2 database? Is that possible? Uh, the answer is yes. It's possible to persist queues in any form you like, provided that you implement a queue plugin yourself. So it is possible to store your queues in DB2. So that presupposes that you've implemented a, um, a queue persistence um, plugin yourself. I've got another question here asking, what is the advantage of using Erlang in comparison to other programming languages that uses the actor's concurrency model, like Scala or Groovy? So that's a pretty good question. Um, I'd say one of the features that I'm very impressed with in Erlang, and it makes it a really sweet spot for protocol implementation in particular, is the binary matching. So I'm not aware of any feature in other languages that are as expressive, as concise as matching, um, doing protocol analysis and matching binaries from the network as we have in Erlang. And I don't think Scholar Groovy has anything quite like that. So I've got a question here to contrast RabbitMQ with ActiveMQ. So the first difference there would be that ActiveMQ, I believe, is written in Java, and RabbitMQ is written in Erlang. So that's the first difference. And ActiveMQ implements JMS, at least. So there are quite a few differences between JMS and RabbitMQ. The most important is that JMS is not a protocol, it's an API, which means that it's impossible for different implementations to interoperate. Um, in the case of RabbitMQ, because it's using AMQP, it's possible for different AMQP implementations to interoperate. So for example, if I had a client written for Cupid, it would be possible to use that to connect to a broker provided by RabbitMQ. While I believe that that level of interoperation is not possible in JMS. I've got a question here asking how does redundancy work in Rabbit? So there's a couple of ways in which redundancy can be implemented. R Rabbit supports clustering, which means that more than one Rabbit, uh, more than one Erlang node um, can be used. And those nodes make use of the Amnesia database to share, um, to share their configuration. And it's possible to set it up in such a way that if one of those nodes disappears, that the other nodes can continue to work. So that would be the simplest way of implementing some way of redundancy. The, other, the better way of implementing redundancy would be to make use of what's called high availability. So in this scenario, you'd set up two different brokers and set up shared storage between the two of them and use a failover mechanism to um, decide which of those two brokers is the active broker. So if something goes wrong on the one broker, it's possible for the other broker to 
read the shared storage and to start up an identical copy and to take over where the first one left off. The um, redundancy story is one that at the moment uses the described scenario on our website uses Pacemaker and DRDB. And we're actively working towards making that easier to implement at the moment. So I've got a question. Can RabbitMQ act as a client to any other AMQP broker in order to chain from another broker? So that's something that's generally called federation. And RabbitMQ does have a plugin called Shovel, which, which lets you do that. So it allows you to um, connect any two brokers together and to act as a client to one and to send all the messages from the one queue to um, another exchange. So if you take a look at the plugins um, on the RabbitMQ website, you will see a link to the Shovel. And that I believe answers exactly the question that you posed here. So there's a question about transactions and how does that work in Spring. Unfortunately, I don't know about how transactions are implemented in Spring. RabbitMQ does implement transactions. Um, how much of that is exposed in Spring, I'm unfortunately not aware. Is, um, is RabbitMQ fully open sourced? Yes, it's fully open sourced. All of the source code um, and all of the officially supported clients are released under the Mozilla public license. So it's possible for anybody to take a look at the source code and even to make contributions. The AMQP specification itself is open as well. So there are no legal fees, there's no legal encumbrances to to doing your own implementation and to interoperate with other implementations. I've heard that exchanges and bindings will be changed to queues and links in AMQP 1.0. What will the differences be? I think this is a big enough topic to actually warrant um, a a webinar all by itself. This is um, something that's in progress at the moment. All I can say is that AMQP 1.0 is has not been finally approved. It doesn't have the final red rubber stamp on it yet. And parts of the specification is still subject to change. Part of the reason why the connectathon is taking place at the moment is to thrash out any issues that arise from interoperation inter inter between different um, prototypes and different implementations at the moment. But I think that's the most that I can say about AMQP 1.0 at this point. Could you summarize the new additions to, AM, to RabbitMQ 2.0 compared to 1.0? For example, message TTLs. So message TTLs is one of the examples of um, something that was added. However, Rabbit is continually getting new features. The biggest difference between 1.0 and 2.0 is the introduction of the persistence layer. What that means is that the number of messages that can be stored in a queue is no longer limited by the amount of RAM that you have in your, in your server, but only by the amount of disk space that you have in your server. If you're still using 1.0, then you should definitely consider upgrading. There are very few reasons to continue to use 1.0. 
Um, there are other changes as well. Um, none of them, I think, are as um, as global in scope as the persistence layer. The questions about comparing RabbitMQ with ActiveMQ, I, I think I've already answered. Um, and the thing to look at for, um, if you're trying to transition from ActiveMQ to RabbitMQ, is to take a look at the Spring AMQP um, pro uh, project. I would like to ask if the message body can be only text string and also any object with some serialization, deserialization defined. That's a very good question. I, I think I did mention that the message has to be a byte array. MQP doesn't have any opinion or it doesn't impose any restriction on what you put in the payload. Unlike JMS, which defines a couple of different um, kinds of messages. MQP simply has a byte array payload. What that means is that any serialization and deserialization that you want to perform, you'd have to coordinate that between the producer and the consumer yourself. And the headers can help you to, um, if producers use a header to mark what kind of message they put, if for some reason you need to send more than one kind of message um, to the same queue, then you can use the headers to distinguish between those and to give clients a clue as to what they can expect, that, whether they need to try and deserialize that message or whether they need to um, interpret it as an object or as a JSON um, string or as something else entirely. So there's a question here, do you have any plans to have priorities on messages? So that is actually part of the specification at the moment. Part of MQP specification says that messages can have priorities. And that is probably the last part of the MQP specification that RabbitMQ does not implement yet. However, there are other ways of achieving the same thing. By using direct queues, um, to use separate queues for separate priorities, you can achieve the same effect. And for that reason, it's not been a high enough priority for us to implement that yet. So here's a question. Does the client buffer the messages if the broker is not available, especially the spring client? No, the client doesn't normally buffer messages. The queues buffer messages. So. Um, if the client, if by client you mean in this case a producer, then that would be a piece of functionality that is specific to the producer. MQP doesn't say what the producer needs to do if the broker is not available. If it needs to buffer those messages, then that's functionality that needs to appear in the producer. In a fan out scenario, what is the point of having several queues rather than one queue and all the consumers using this queue? That's a good question. Um, so the reason why you might have, why you might want more than one queue in a fan out scenario, is if some of your consumers are actually are quite slow, and if some of your consumers are faster than your other consumers, and the same copy of all the messages need to go to all the consumers, then a fan out um, would be the right way, to, would be the correct implementation. Where do we set the acknowledgement mode? Um, so it's possible for messages to be acknowledged either automatically or it's possible for clients to decide that they want to explicitly acknowledge messages. Is there a maximum number of consumers and producers? Does this increase in connected components? Um, no, AMQP doesn't define any maximum, and RabbitMQ doesn't impose any maximum either. This would be entirely up to your operating system. I see that we've, um, we're at the top of the hour now, so 
I want to thank you all very much for showing an interest in RabbitMQ. And if you're at all interested in reviewing this material, then you can take a look at the uploaded version of this WebEx from Monday. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.